welcome to the third session of the SAVO Oral History Project. We're privileged today to have as our guest Mr. William Powey, actually from West Savo, who certainly knew Savo history for decades uh, before and during World War II. We certainly welcome him. We look forward to his telling us about his family background, his experiences growing up in Sayville, life in Sayville, and West Sayville, and the special memories that he, had, that he has of individuals and events. We welcome William Powey. Um, I was born in West Sayville. I'm, I'm a true native. Um, in West Sable in 1929, and I graduated from Sable High School and went directly to a job in New York City. Um, so therefore I did not go to college, but I really feel that working in the job that I had at the Equitable Life Assurance Society in New York, I, and I retired from there. And, uh, I got up to the position of um, manager of the tax accounting department where we had, uh, we, we, our responsibility was withholding taxes from all the employees and um, this encompassed the whole country because it was a nationwide concern and um, we had to keep track of all of those individual taxes, income taxes from all of the little boroughs and wherever uh, we had employees and, uh, and at the end of the year we had to produce um, thousands of uh, W-2 forms and 1099 forms and uh, I had people working under me that, that handled this. Uh, but it was an education for me uh, to do this because I became uh, good at writing and then introducing people coming from the colleges which was very interesting because many of those coming from the colleges could not write a decent letter. They couldn't, they didn't, they couldn't um, express themselves. And I would read their letters and say, now what are you trying to say here? And uh, they, well, it's all right there on the paper, but, but I don't understand it. And I'm in the business and I don't understand that. And so that was very interesting to, uh, to, to do that. But. Um, and they have been very good to me. And I retired in 1987, so I've been uh, out in the world for a while. So let's start from the beginning. You were born in West Sable. Yes. Were you born at home? Yes, I was. That house is still there. Where is that? <laughs> it's on Cherry Avenue. Which is uh, the number? What number? Uh, number 86, Cherry Avenue. Uh, of course, it didn't have numbers way back then. and. Uh, the folks that, that bought the house now, it was in our family till uh, probably 20 years ago because my mother lived there and then two old aunts lived there. And, um, and when they passed away, then we sold the house. Uh, and uh, the people that bought it um, put another piece on the house and they really renewed it and made it a very modern uh, house inside. And it's lovely and I've had privilege to go into there and see and to, and to see the house, what they had done to it. Did your family build the house originally? No, they didn't. Uh, that house was a, I believe they had chickens in one room and, <laughs> and at one time it was a schoolhouse. At that time it was really uh, uh, very interesting. History. history. Yeah. My father kept chickens, but he kept him down, his outside. <laughs> Were your parents born in Sayville? Oh, no, yeah. my mother and father were both born in Holland. Uh, what was so your mother's maiden name? My mother's maiden name was Vershura. Yeah. Uh, well known uh, West Sable name. Yeah, because then she had many brothers and sisters. And so, uh, but everyone in West Sable at that time and for many years after that was related because they married into, you know, if you, you didn't go outside the, the little where you lived to, to find a mate and uh, I got down to third cousins well that was close enough to suit me but <laughs> <laughs> so how many children in your family my, my mother had nine children uh, 
My brother was the oldest. He was 23 years older than I, and, and I was the youngest. I'm, I'm the baby of the family. And they were, uh, there were twins that died in infancy and another little girl that died at age five. But the rest of them were, were girls between there, so there were, they were six of us uh, as adults. And, what did your father do for them? My father was a, a clam digger, yeah. um, and he also was a carpenter. Um, way back then, you, you did what you could find to work at and what would pay. He worked for, for several years for um, Fred Smith from yes. uh, Bayport. A builder. A builder. And he worked on many of the fine homes here in Sable because of that. Uh, he worked on St. Anne's um, uh, Parish House when they were building it. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then those uh, the children's homes across the way there, he worked over in there. And several of the nice homes down in, in uh, South Sable. Um, and then, but he was also a clan digger. I remember going out on the boat with him. And, Independent? Or uh, he or he rode with somebody. He, he rode on someone else's boat, and um, Albert Oakley. Does he hear yes, that name? Yes. And uh, I can remember very vividly uh, catching fish while while he was trying to clam, and then he had to bait the hook every time. And I kept carry. I had a bucket full of fish. The poor man didn't get any clamming done, <laughs> and I remember falling overboard. Um, and um, coming up with, and my father was right in the water, right to catch me when I got back up. It was, I just remember that. Uh, I just, Did your mother stay home? My mother worked at, uh, she worked for uh, another uh, richer people, apparently. But, uh, we, we, had, we were poor. We were poor. And so um, my mother was a good saver. And if anyone needed a pair of new shoes, she always had managed it. Though. She had some money put aside for something like the that. The Dutch virtue. The, the Dutch virtue, exactly, exactly. And she made do. I can remember dinner being, um, a, well, today's equivalent of Bisquick with, with apples stuck in, and that was dinner. Wow. You know, uh, that type of thing. And fritters. Fritters went a long way. You could put a lot of things in it. Um, and, but she was always a good provider with, with food, and um, and always ready to laugh. My mother was a was a very jolly person. But then after, <laughs> we we remember when she got to be in her eighties, uh, she was very proudly said, "Well, I have a job." And I said, "Oh goodness, what what are you going to do?" She said, "Well, there's this older lady that's blind around the around the corner here, and she said uh, I'm going to take care of her, so I'm I'm going to have a job there." So. She was, an old, she was taking care of an old lady, but my mother was in her 80s at that point, so I couldn't knock her down. She was a great lady. There were a few uh, Reformed churches in West Sable. First Reformed, Christian Reformed, Christian Reformed, and there was a really true Dutch The Dutch Reformed, Reformed. Oh, yeah. And on Sunday afternoons, they, um, we could hear them singing. Um, it was a, a block and a half away. We could hear them their lusty singing over there. And of course, everything was in Dutch. They did their whole service in Dutch with no accompaniment. So they, they had what they call a voorzinger. He was the leader, and um, he sang the loudest. And uh, they all followed him. But we can remember that. And uh, But his, they did get an organ after that, because the daughter of that those folks um, played the organ. Uh, but we remember that. But I was brought up in the Christian Reformed Church. All right, which is still which, on Atlantic Avenue. Uh, the, the church is there, but they, they, have, they have a new church on Rollstone Avenue. That ah. church was, was uh, sold to Gospel Community. Ah. And the Gospel Community has taken over the old Bailey Lumberyard where they, there was another church in there, so there they've moved. But when I got, after I got married, um, the church did not offer um, a music program that, because of my my music training, um, I wanted something where I could use my talent. And so um, we moved then to the uh, First Reformed Church. Yes, um, which that, is on... on... And that's on Cherry Avenue, Cherry. and that's no longer... That's no longer there. Yeah. That, that became New Life Community Church, which is the one on Lakeland. Right. Right. Um, and then the uh, Indians took over the uh, St. Mary Malachi, I think his name, the name is, and they, they have a very colorful church there now. They have uh, 
and there's such a large Indian population around. And a lot of, I don't know how many of those come from local, but they do come from all the way from New Jersey to that church. So. All right. Now that uh, Dutch Reformed was on Main Street. That yeah, the one that was on Main Street was was. Be, I think it yeah, was around was, where uh, Pepper and Van Emmerich. Exactly, it was that. It's that right in that building, I believe. That takes me back quite a few years. In that building. I had, and the reason I got involved with this whole project, I had a, and I'd become very sentimental about this, a very dear step-great-grandfather okay. who was born in Sable in 1866. The German family had come over uh, with the Munkelwitz family, the Rakos and the Munkelwitzes, and uh, via the Long Island Railroad to uh, Lakeland, and then somehow came down here, and however they acquired the land, etc., would, would be very interesting, but it's obviously all unknown. There was no uh, southern branch of the Long Island Railroad back then. It didn't come to Sable until the early 68. I guess the Rakos were here around 1864 with the Munkelwitzes. Well, when he was growing up, this person, Albert Rako, my step-great-grandfather, with another friend, you realize there was virtually nothing around here. I'm talking the 1870s. There was nothing around here. The two boys walked over to West Sable, which must have been nothing back then, I mean, to walk that distance. And they heard the music in the Dutch Reformed Church, and they went in and listened to it. And that would be a Sunday evening entertainment. Yes, yes. And he told me about it, and it shows you, in a way, the innocence and goodness that was to be found back then. That's cool. Yeah. And, uh, he told me quite a few uh, stories of growing up in Sable. He recalled, obviously, the blizzard of 88 and all. And he went to a school which was situated where the Sable Firehouse is now. That was the school back in the 1870s, mm -hmm. 1880s, before 1888. And this is the edifice that was uh, here. And he had a daughter. <clears throat> he had uh, actually three children, one of whom uh, survived, whom I would come to know, and that was his daughter, Martha Beyer. Uh, her husband was Henry Beyer, who they were married in February of 1918, and on November 1st of 1918, he died of the, in the flu epidemic. They have the plot in uh, Union Cemetery. Well, anyway, she too was very interested in Sable history. She was a longtime bookkeeper at the T.N. Otto Oil and Coal Company at, uh, right over here at uh, Greeley Avenue at the railroad tracks. And she too uh, told me a lot of uh, early history of Sable, and uh, they certainly developed my interest, not only in the history of Sable, but in the interest in, in history. And uh, I'm, I'm forever greatly indebted to them. They were members of the Methodist Church. Uh, let me interject a little bit. Sure. Uh, with the, we re I have memories of Mr. Otto. Uh, this is Thomas and Thomas, Otto. Thomas Otto. Moved, uh, grew, he brought his cow from Saxon Avenue, where they lived, and brought it to that, the, that mm -hmm. huge lot that was across on the east side of Cherry Avenue. And he tethered that cow in there every day. And Mr. Otto's cow was over there. <laughs> oh, How far was that from where he lived? Had? It was just, well, they were, they were on the other side of, of the brook. So they were oh. just in Sable on Saxon Avenue. Uh, that's where the school is now, okay. the high school. And uh, I remember him leading that cow along the street there, oh, tethering the cow. Oh, His uh, one daughter, he had two daughters, I recall, certainly that survived. The one daughter was Virginia Otto, who, who married uh, Smith, Jewett Smith, and she became the owner uh, for its last decades of the uh, Suffolk citizen, or became the Sable citizen. 
she was very prominent with the Salem Historical Society yeah. and all. Uh, th there were many societies in Savo. Uh, you may think that you know these people just went to work every day on the bay or cut wood, etc. But there was a staggering large number of societies, not only church organizations but social organizations. Yes. Uh, Great Grandpa Rocco joined the Odd Fellows, and way back in 1909 or so. He lived till 91 in 1957. He was noble grand of the Oddfellows. He lived to reach the, uh, 63 years in the Sable Oddfellows Lodge. And they both belonged to the uh, Aunt Maddie, of course, to the Rebecca's, and both belonged to the, uh, or he certainly, to the Masons. There were many organizations you know, it, it, and these people got around what? If, if not on horses, then on bicycles? Yes, bicycles. Or walked. Life was so uh, different. They, they, you know, had nothing else, right. and, and they managed to do so much. They rode bicycles from West Sable to, to the Patrick Lace Mill, uh, the ladies. Uh, and, uh, I uh, also was in touch with a member of the old Winters family, and uh, I have this in writing, and it'll certainly go to the archive here. Uh, a Mr. Winter, who lived on Lakeland Avenue, would walk along the railroad to Oakdale and walk back, and I think he w worked at the uh, Vanderbilt estate. And you know, this was just a routine. For, for us, it would be unthinkable. I mean, we seem to have gotten so soft and, and so uh, convenience-dependent, it's re really yes. gotten to be absurd. Uh, a dear classmate from the class of 53, Catherine will remember her, Dorothy Shunk, uh, grew up on Willett Avenue, a short, very short distance from here, and uh, she married Andy Stewart, also from our class of 1953, Sable High School, and at some point, Dorothy was asked by her father, she was a youngster, to please go to Otto's four or five gallons of gasoline. Now, it's a short walk from their home on Willard Avenue to Greeley. And, and she went easily and made the purchase, probably with through Aunt Maddie there, and uh, went back home. She said, she writes me in the letter, Emil, it would be unthinkable of any of my children today to be asked to go and get a five-gallon container of uh, gasoline uh, a block or two away. That brought, re reminded me of uh, my father did work for on the Bourne estate also. Um, he was at, uh, took care of the, uh, uh, the chickens there. I, I think they had a, an extensive farm uh, where that windmill was on the board of state, yeah. and the, the chicken houses, I believe the poultry houses were yeah. in that area, and I do remember that he worked, that was before my time, before my time, he worked there. Uh, of course, the family had been in existence for a bit before I came along, um, and in fact, my, my next sibling was, was nine and a half years older than I, and it's just she and I left now, but the rest, but she was spoiled until I came along, and <laughs> uh, I think I did spoil things then. <laughs> what do you remember West Sable looking like back then? Well, I, I can remember um, that blizzard of uh, 38, or no, the hurricane of, no. Hurricane of 38. 38, yeah, we, we were, I went to the Tyler Avenue School, which is the maintenance building for the school now, and it was right around the corner from me. But I remember before school, before I was allowed to go to school, I was allowed to ride in the neighborhood on my tricycle. And um, one day the principal stopped at our home and asked my mother to please keep little William home during the day because he was disrupting classes at the school. I was up the top of the slide singing to the top of my lungs way back then, before I even went to school. 
And um, she said, please keep him home because he's, she, he's, when we have the windows open, the kids can't concentrate because he's singing so loud out there. But um, that's the school that I went to for the first six grades. And then I came to Sable for the, uh, but I remember going to kindergarten here in old 88. And uh, I was uh -huh. very impressed because we were allowed to bring our tricycles to school. We were and, allowed to ride around on our tricycles in the classroom. And the kindergarten teacher was? I, that I don't recall, but I think it was a, a, a Miss Edwards. It was a Miss Edwards. Because I had Miss Clarissa Edwards for first and second grade. Um, and it was a Two grades in a room. And uh, I was uh, cut up then, I, I, I admit this, uh, because I learned everything from first and second grade in first grade. And then in second grade I was bored, and so then I was, you know, and the same thing happened with three and four and five and six. Were they but, in this building too? That, no, that was that was in that Tyler Avenue school. There were four rooms in that school. Three of them were occupied, and the other one was for the assembly. And, uh, so do you, you remember the day of the hurricane? I do remember being sent home that day, um, and uh, I do remember trees down, but nothing more than that. I, it was. Uh, well, I was eight, I was nine years old then. Uh, so I, I do remember that much, being sent home from school and being very impressed with that, that, oh, this must be really something. But other than that, it didn't impress me at that point. Um, Where did you shop in West Salem? Uh, there was a, um, a market down on Main Street. Uh, Rudy Cachera had that uh, market down there on Main Street. And also, the um, Sammy Green had a store yes. on the corner of Cherry and uh, Mount Montauk Highway. Northwest. Uh, and um, George Ross worked there. Yes. I and see. my mother, uh, to make a little extra money, used to wash George Ross's shirts and, and iron them. And, uh, but they had an, one of the lockers, John Locker. Uh, he used yes. to come to the house on Monday mornings and, and pick up the list, the shopping list. And then later on in the day, he would come in, um, and bring those groceries. And I know that my mother and, uh, and father ran up a bill there. They had to, uh, you know, yeah. we'll pay you when we can. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and we had our, our, the mortgage on our home was from, uh, from the Bates, uh, John Bates. Yes. Yes, we, we had our... Well, it was Sammy Green where, where we had the uh, mortgage. And um, I can remember in later years uh, when the mortgage was almost paid for, I guess it was, and going down with the $14.71 uh, mortgage money for that month. That uh, certainly was a had, lot of and money. But had to write that down in a book. Yes. And uh, yeah, there was, uh, but then that was very interesting to, to, to shop that way. Uh, yes. And then if, you needed, if we needed something, uh, in a hurry, we could run through the backyards over to Rollstone, where the Vanessa Duffs had a store. Really? A store over on Rollstone? On Rollstone. By the uh, main road? No, it was on, well, partway up the, up the road. Uh, and they they lived upstairs, and oh, the store on. was on, on the channel really the main the first floor. It's a home today? It's a home today. There are there two apartments in there. That, that really house is still there. And then there was another store down on, on Atlantic Avenue, the Ben Wyans store. Yes, store that there. I recall. Um, Going down to visit the BBs. Yes, uh, and yeah. I remember the, those, those people. Um, and my brother lived on the, in the house on West Avenue right behind that. Right. Because he was married to a Ben Wyan. But uh, I can remember having to go down there because the, the Ladies' Aid Society uh, did embroidery. And um, this, the lady, the, Mrs. Van Wyen, was in charge of the, um, all of the threads and, the, and the, the, the stamped pillowcases that they had to sew. And I, I can remember having to go down to visit her to get these mm -hmm. supplies for my mother so she could do that. What did you do for fun as a little boy? For fun? Well, uh, I can remember, 
I had a box full of blocks, and I can remember those, and I played with those by the hour. And I had um, little metal uh, cars, and I, 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 and being brought up in a, in a house full of sisters, because uh, my brother was out of the house by that time, he had gone to college, and um, I, I amused myself with, with a box of blocks and, 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 and these little cars. Uh, I don't remember reading way back then that much. Um, I, and I remember on Saturday afternoons I always listened to the opera. Uh, I would find some excuse to be in the house for that. And being in, in, a, in a house full of girls, I, they're all knitting. I want to learn how to do that. So I did. I learned how to knit. And, the, and I learned how to crochet. And I did um, lots of things, that, and they would come to me and, how, what does this mean on this pattern, Bill? I, we, I can't understand it, so I would show them how to do it after they taught me how to do it in the first place. But uh, little things, I, and Argyle socks, and, 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 uh, I, I made those. And um, it, was, it was just something to do while listening to the opera. Uh, but I, I stayed out of trouble uh, for the most part. Uh, but now I can remember the church having a, an entertainment and they had the windows open. And I heard this music and so I went and investigated. It was after dark and I was not supposed to be out after dark. And uh, they came looking for me. They figured where I was because they knew that this guy is going to go listen to the music. And um, so sure enough, they found me and they were, I was scolded for that very soundly and uh, brought home. Uh, I don't remember that it was what, just one memory that, that I had, but uh, music has always played a very important part of my life. Um, having sung in a boy choir, and uh, and then um, when I got to high school, my voice was changing all through high school. No music, uh, but I took music courses in high school, and that's how I got through my senior years. Easy courses because for music it was just a, such a natural for me, and. Um, I had very nice marks in, the, in my senior year. <laughs> Did you play an instrument too? Did you learn an instrument? I tried piano. I knew more than the teacher, and so it was it was a failure. I, I have a piano in my home now. Uh, when I'm learning a new piece of music, I can I can I can play it out for myself to learn it. Um, and um, I'm still learning new pieces of music, but I most of the time I'm, I'm depending on my old library. Because I do solo work. But music has always been an important part of my life. Was it important to your parents too? Is that where the interest comes from? My mother, my mother loved to sing. In fact, she's singing up there now, I'm sure. But uh, my father had a nice bass voice, uh, but he was not brought up in the church that much. But when he married my mother, he did go to church, and, and he would enjoy the singing too. So, and my sisters all sang. So we were we were a musical family. Hmm. We were a musical. What are your recollections of learning in the Sable schools of the faculty? I, I had, I think I, for the most part, I had good teachers. Uh, I enjoyed, uh, when I got into high school, it was um, Miss Knowles, who was the she was guidance teacher or whatever. Uh, guidance and she was the one that got me my job at, at Equitable. And you know, all those years old, and I graduated one week, and I started work the next. And Vanda Knowles. Vanda Knowles, and then she was, of course, the uh, she and Miss Rogers uh, did the senior plays all the time, and, and all the other plays, and so I took dramatics, of course, because this is part of me, and uh, I was the star of the uh, the senior play, and that's what people remembered me in my, in my class. They remembered me for because I was the star of the senior play, but uh, but I was always a clown in the school too, so I, I, I would cause trouble for other kids because I'd make <laughs> remarks under my breath and they'd all be laughing and I'd sit there with an angelic look on my face and well, I didn't do anything. <laughs> but I've always been that way, so it's uh, everybody, and I'm still that way, I, I, I like to laugh, I like to laugh. You recall Miss Schultz? Oh, Mrs. Schultz, yes, Mrs. Schultz, well I had her in junior high, yeah. seventh grade, I believe it was, that I had her, I don't think I had her in eighth grade, well, 
one of those two. Yes. But I can always remember her for the last 15 minutes of every class, she read from a book for us. I can remember her reading Lassie. Uh, and not, I don't think she went any, any deeper than that. But always we looked forward to that last 15 minutes because she was reading the book to us. And that was, uh, that was impressive. And Mr. Rogers. Yes. Now that was eighth grade American was, history. Yeah. And maybe that's he was why. a member of an old uh, Sable family. Yes. His father yes. was a carpenter. Yes. Builder. Yes. Yeah. But I had some good teachers in high school too. Uh, that I, Mr. Desser. Yes. Also business. Also business. And he was he, my homeroom teacher. Okay. Herman Desser. He would excuse himself in the afternoon at some point to go, which we think he was calling his bookie, but we're not sure. But <laughs> that, that <laughs> I'm tell, story went on until school. my time. Okay, you, you remember that too, so that's good. Thank you for corroborating that. Uh, and then there was Vernon Eels. Vernon Eels. I did not have room for anything. Ah. I didn't have uh, um, the physics teacher. I didn't have him for anything either. Uh, those were the sciences. I didn't need them because I was on a business course, uh, and I didn't need those. Um, in fact, I didn't need the fourth year history class because I, I, I didn't. I found out I didn't need it for my curriculum, and so uh, we. Uh, yes, and you have to have so many credits from yes. high school to yes. be. Yes. You I, certainly I, had Mr. Brucci. I did not have him for any classes because I had him for the early history. And Brucci was going to be my teacher for the, yes. for the senior class, and I knew right. I'd heard so many stories. And I had no idea. Wonders don't cease. That's right. That's right. My I'm wife really didn't like his teachers, his, his classes either. So, but I, some other people loved. You probably liked it very much because of the history. Yes. Yes. What year and did you graduate? Forty-seven. Nineteen forty-seven. We still have reunions. Uh, we we had religiously a reunion every five years. Someone this fellow that lives in South Carolina held us all together. Then when we got to 60, uh, he said, well, this is going to be the last one. And I said, no, we, don't, we can't do this. So now every year after the alumni walk on graduation day, I have them come over to my house for a, for a luncheon and for a get-together. And last year there were eight of us. There were only 84 to begin with, and they're, they've gone one right after the other. But... Uh, and some of the poor souls are, are suffering with um, things like dementia and what have you. And so they really are and, and are physically disabled and, and cannot come to them. But there, I think that there's only some 20 some left from that 84. So last year we had a, a, a group 80th birthday because we were all going to be 80 on that year. So we did that. But I'm a frustrated chef, so I, I feed them all. And so we, we have fun with that. That's my hobby now, is, is cooking. And um, I still do singing. I'm, I'm out three nights a week for rehearsals. And then for year, several years after I retired, we started an African violent business out of, the, out of our home. It was my wife's hobby, so it was all her fault, and I blamed her for this. But we had 3,500 plants in our basement. And... Uh, we had 900 varieties, and I thought, well, maybe we can make a little business of this. And so I had a 16-page catalog we shipped all over the world for um, with violence. And so that all of those people are in my background too. And so, wow. yeah. you mentioned clamming as something you did as a child, your father's business. What other role did the Great South Bay play in your growing up? Everyone in West Sable were. were did the same thing, but clamors or fishermen. So this was a very important part of our our, uh, our bringing up because we were we were subjected to this. And cold weather, of course, none of them could work. So then they looked for other odd jobs to do. But the Great, Great South Bay did govern. Uh, it's amazing now there are no boats out there, you know, compared to what it was. Uh, you could always look out and see a, a sea of clam diggers uh, out there on their boats. Now, in the in the marinas, they're all uh, pleasure boats out there. Now, you know, you just don't see any of that. Um, and I think that they're sorry that they 
clammed it to death because now they're they're trying to reclaim that land with by planting more clams out there to, to cleanse the water. And I think that they're being partially successful. Um, but I think that was a very important part of, of West Salem. And, the, and then they worked in the, the oyster shanties too in the in the winter when they were catching, uh, digging the oysters. And then they had these oyster shanties where the men would go to open those oysters and they, they shipped those from uh, from Sayville here to uh, to the city, to the restaurants in the city. And of course, they didn't have refrigeration then, so they packed things in ice, and they, they filled the boxcars on the on the railroad, and they went in on that. It was, uh, but that that was that was a, a very all the way from Oakdale to into Sable, and then uh, that was all what they did. That's what the men did. Uh, Great uh, grandfather Albert Rako also worked in West Sable, and he admired all of his uh, colleagues there, working at, at the Blue Points and the Rudolph family yes. company, yeah. mm -hmm. and uh, the Oakers, the, the, Jake yes, Oka is the, the king of, sure. of that industry, and uh, then at times he would bicycle up to Northport. And there was a, a good deal of uh, fish, fishing activity up there, and he would stay up there for a few weeks yes. and then bicycle back. Yeah. I find those items in old Suffolk County news issues that, yes. you know, Albert Rako has returned home after two weeks up in Northport. Yeah. The Great South Bay was also a playground for the children, wasn't it? Yes, there were beaches where they could they could swim, and uh, um, I learned to swim in the Great South Bay. Um, the Red Cross swim, swimming lessons were done in the bay, um, and I remember they had nets around for the to keep the jellyfish out. And, and, and uh, but there was a pavilion down in, in West Sable. The Sable had several of them, um, and uh, the bay was very important. And then in, in Sable here, they had the uh, those a couple of resorts down in the uh, in those um, seaside hotels down there that uh, uh, people came from far to, to be near the bay. Can you explain why West Sable didn't develop more? Is it because of the largely homogeneous Dutch population so. that they're very conservative, very traditional, exactly. I think and really the unto themselves? I think that's the reason. That's the reason we didn't branch out. Well, I, I mean, my, Sable was conservative. My pride, my pride came from local too, so you know, it just you just didn't do things like this. Sable was conservative and traditional, and uh, unto itself enough. But the, again, they were German families or uh, English families. Right. Exactly. But Sable managed to open up in that it uh, attracted New York City visitors, that there were so many of these uh, hotels for summer visitors, and how many Sable families had second small homes up in this undeveloped region above the tracks that rent out their houses in the summer and, and go up to their little homes, the which they only use <clears throat> for two or three months a year. Yeah. This was a very widespread uh, yeah. Uh, the practice. But the West Sable people didn't do that. And uh, again, you know, <laughs> with all due respect, I, I will always have the greatest respect for the community and all, but I kind of think theater was off limits. Oh, yes. I said it very discreetly. You did it very nicely. No movies, no dancing, no card playing. Uh -huh. No drinking. And no no drinking. It was, it was um, very, very strict. Um, upbringing. So you didn't have that. I don't know uh, what happened to me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know uh, just who was initially responsible, but the Opera House was built on Candy Avenue, yes. and actors and actresses came out and stayed in Sable. A very few came to live in the area. A number one actress who had a very distinguished Broadway career, who should be written about, 
lived in Bayport. I know the house on the, just south of Middle Road, I think on Gillette Avenue and all. Mm -hmm. And she's buried in St. Anne's Cemetery, Effie Shannon. Effie Shannon. Effie Shannon, yeah. Uh, she's one excellent example. Then also, there would be the novelty movie theater, as it was called, to become the Sable Theater on Railroad Avenue. And then there was this Crescent Theater, which stood on Gillette Avenue, right behind the Opera House. There's all parking lot there today. Yes. But it was a large theater. It was built in 1914. Two uh, local uh, people are responsible for it, a Fuchsius and, uh, I believe, George Mantha. In any case, it seated 340 people. This is a large theater, and it came up essentially to the back of uh, Thornhills and the other stores, and then it was not run well, question mark. In any case, by the time of the Depression, it became a real victim. This is the Crescent Theater, and for years was vacant until it was demolished in 1937. And examining some of the uh, newspapers around that time, once that theater came down, the stores on Main Street in that immediate vicinity Thornhills and those that followed began to expand in the back and improve, make more use of, since we don't have a uh, declining building in, uh, you know, in our view. So uh, a rata, a lawyer, established his office on the second floor of the second building, and it, it, this expansion, these renovations, made Sable newspaper stories. I can remember a picture of a minstrel show, I guess it was, in, that they did in the West Sable Fire Hall, and there were, there were a couple of hundred people in the cast, and this was a wide picture of, I know that one of my sisters was in the chorus line or whatever it was uh, way back then, uh, but that was really a, a departure for West Sable to do something like that. But, uh, Did the people from West Sable really just stay on the West Sable side? Yes, they and were. They Sable were very, was there. Yeah. If it weren't for the schools, it'd really be exactly. pretty much. Oh, yes, they schools. were very much. Although many of the uh, people uh, went to Sable for the uh, to the Methodist Church, I believe it was. Uh, for Sunday evening services. Uh, that was a very popular thing. But you see, this was what their lives were, were just um, <clears throat> was encircled by this, this religious business. And so they were very, very strict. We were not allowed to uh, uh, play outside very often on a Sunday because this was just not done. Sunday was a family day and everybody sat still in the home, and, and that was, this is how you did it. Um, but from my father's family, they were a little bit more liberal, um, so I would always love to go to grandma and grandpa's because they, you know, I could do things over there. I could play Chinese checkers with grandma or whatever, and and, uh, uh, and it, was be, it would be okay because I was doing it with grandma. But, um, uh, and now he's, he's a, uh, my grandfather was a, uh, part of the history of, of uh, West Sable and Sable. Um, he had a, um, a franchise, I believe it was, from S uh, Standard Oil, and he um, delivered kerosene to people that you know, they heated their homes and, and uh, were there. Uh, and he had a gas station when the gasoline came in uh, uh, on Main Street in West Sable, where that big parking lot is now. And that was then bought by someone else from West Sable after my grandfather stopped that business. And that's after that was, was when Bud Van Ryan bought the business with his father. So this little Chamber of Commerce building down here uh, on the corner of Lincoln 
was my grandfather's uh, gas station. That was erroneously published a couple of years ago when they moved it, uh, when they said that it was Bud Van Ryan's yeah. thing. I, I, I disputed that. I said, no, 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 that was my grandfather's. But they had a tin building. I remember that they called it the tin building on their property. There was, um, they were diagonally across the alley from us. And um, I would go over there and fill our, our five-gallon can with kerosene to bring home. So, uh, there should be a written record of this here in the archive, or certainly at that uh, building. Yeah. Because th this is uh, just how all of this misinformation becomes almost accepted True. fact. He delivered, he delivered the, the kerosene in the area with, with a horse and buggy, uh, and he had a tank on there. And uh, what was his name? Adrian. Adrian Powley. My brother was named. And that was my father's father. And he was—he brought his family here from Holland. Yes. Oh. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and he had a brother or two. Um, in fact, one brother that stayed in Holland was uh, had seventeen children. Uh, <laughs> whoops! And they are responsible for some of those large uh, tulip fields in the northern part of Holland. Mm -hmm. Though that family is still active there. Say. Um, I've not ever been there. Oh. Uh, I have a niece that, that visited over there and said, yeah, that, that, that's, that's truly they, that's who they are. Because I saw pictures of that, that um, patriarch of that family and it was exactly the duplicate of my, my grandfather. And he had another brother that moved to Michigan and so they established a big Powie family out there, but I'm, I'm the last one here. Uh, I had daughters, so I, I couldn't pass on my name. Uh, and my brother had a daughter. So uh, the Powie name in this area is, is, uh, is me. Uh, but, uh, and there never became a Powie Street. No, no. We had an alley there that was uh, a Powie here and a Powie here and a Powie here. And my mother's brother lived over here, and it was, it was everybody was together. On Cherry? On Cherry Ave. Tyler Abner takes a jog up at the top. That's where my grandfather was in that area. Right. So. When you said your family was poor, was that a result of the Depression? Oh, definitely, definitely. I can remember taking the, uh, a little express wagon from West Sable to Sable where they were handing out, I think it was at the courthouse on John Railroad Avenue. They were handing food out there. And I can remember going home with sacks of potatoes and uh, things like that that, that we, my mother stretched into into decent meals. But um, yeah, it was definitely a uh, But depression. essentially, the immigrants coming over were poor. Yeah. I mean, it, it's remarkable. Yeah, they were poor when they got here. Yes. Exactly, exactly. It, it's remarkable that the, the Rakos had a, a few sons, and uh, he, uh, the father, when they arrived here, managed to get a job when they were building the railroad through yeah. Sable. Right. But he died, he was not well, he died soon after, and the widow married a, this is an old familiar name, a Fellerath. Oh, yes. And uh, so great-grandpa Rocco had a uh, step-brother, Eddie Fellerath, and he perished in early 1942 with that railroad crossing in Brentwood Mr. Coulson. with uh, Mr. Colson, yeah. who was certainly a major figure in West Sable. Yes. I think they had the funeral at the firehouse in West Sable. They certainly did. I remember that. I remember that. About 19, it's 1942. I, read, I was at that funeral because I was in the juvenile fire department at that point. And um, I was always so impressed that that, that was yeah. a room full of people. Oh my. Whose funeral was it? Uh, a man by the name of William Colson. C O L S O N. He was um, a, a tax assessor for the town of Islip. And um, he was very big in the fire department in West Sayville. And um, his widow lived next door to me, where I, where I live right now. Um, and um, she, was in, she was a locker. One of the lockers, and um, which was a large family in West Sayville, yes. but he was a um, a nice man. I, I I only knew him just vaguely because he was there. Um, I knew his family, um, and 
Jim. The emblem that West Sable Fire Department has, the, the wooden shoe with a, with a, with a feather coming out of yes. it, the racing that, was, team. that was Bill Colson's, that was Mr. Colson's design. Ah. And um, I saw the original of that, that he, yeah. had, that he had done. Uh, but uh, he was, he, they had a, a racing team in West Sable that still is very active. Uh, I think they only lost two of their tournaments this, uh, this past season. Um, and it was, that was something that held the community together too. They had the, everyone came out to cheer for the, for the team. Uh, and all of the other fire departments did this too. Um, and West Sable was a consistent winner. They, they, they won, won, won. And he was, uh, this man was, uh, Mr. Colson was always looking for loopholes in the rules so that they could, and, and he, and they, it paid off. One race I recall was a, uh, an extension ladder race, so they had to open an extension ladder and climb this ladder up onto a scaffold, and that would, and the first one up would win. It was all timed. He um, designed a step ladder, or a, a, an extension ladder that had only two rungs. It was an extension ladder, and <laughs> it was the, but it was a loophole, and he, and of course they won because they didn't have to stop and open the thing, and <laughs> but that was the type of thing that he did, and he was really. A, clever man, but uh, that was the, the one story that I just remember so vividly. In short, it's the churches in West Sable, it's the firehouse in West Sable, yes, it's very and that was the sum of the activities. Yes. In contrast to Sable, with all of its organizations, yes. yes. etc., to which West Sable, uh, the participants uh, came and uh, yes. were very important yes. figures, there's no question about that. Were there operas at the Opera House? Did you get to go? No, and I don't think that they ever put an opera. No, on. it's it called was, Opera House. It's called no, Opera House. It was just a misnomer, but they, they did uh, uh, stage presentations there. Did um, you get to go to those? I didn't go to those. I was, I was much too young, and of course that was probably forbidden. Probably. Uh, and then there were uh, movies. No, we weren't allowed to go there either. Then it be, uh, became a bowling alley. Yes. Yeah, I was, it was an occasion when I was allowed to go to a movie. I think it was Snow White, the first one I saw was, a, you know, okay. I, it, was, it was just not, not something that we did. Any memories of World War II? World War II, I, I was not, uh, you know, that would have been 42, yeah. Um, I had a brother-in-law that was in, that had gone off on a, on a boat, but uh, no, they, it didn't affect us for some reason. Uh, it was but some families some, were. Some, there were a lot of families we knew. Some from West Sable did die. Yeah, there was a quake. There was, there was a quake, and there was an un, uh, the fellow became an undertaker, Ellen Wood Scopper. Ellen Wood Scopper, yes. He worked for Rainers for yes. maybe did his internship yeah, there in yeah. the 30s. And then didn't he have his own place after that? Yes. Yeah. And he was lost in the war too. Uh, and then when I was, I, I was in the, the service from 1951 to 53, that was during the Korean conflict. And um, it's funny, I, I, I got into the service and and I was there in basic training for about a week, I guess, and they found out that I knew what a typewriter was. Much better than that, I knew how to work one. So it was the end of my basic training because I, they had way back then they were they were activating uh, National Guard. Um, you I was in the National Guard for six years. Be careful. Oh, okay, I'll be very careful. This group was a, they were a bunch of rednecks from Alabama. Um. And they were away from their families, and boy, they were, they were really went wild. But I spent the rest of my basic training uh, in, in an office, uh, doing work for the lieutenant and the captain. And then they sent me to school. They, they, they sent me to what they thought was going to be clerk typist school, but they, of course, made a mistake. And it was a steno school. And it was an 18-week um, course instead of just an eight-week course, so another mistake on their part. And I became uh, a seno, and I did uh, court martials and things like that. And I wound up being a uh, secretary to a two or three-star general. And uh, it was 
an easy job because all I had to do was get his morning paper and that was about it and do some typing. Uh, it was a posh job. But these poor fellows that had to go to Korea that were, that were in those outfits that I was in, if they were to call for someone with my classification, the lieutenant said, or the captain said, no, no, we can't lose you, we're going to change your number, we're, you're not that this week, you're something else. And so I, you know, I, that was... But I, I fought the Battle of Cape Cod. <laughs> I, I'm not proud of it, but this is how it happened, just because I could type. So. Hmm. Any other West Sable stories? Yes, I have a question for you. Halloween is coming uh, up. Like a Halloween this, story. this was uh, newspaper headline material, not only locally, but in New York City newspapers, I gather when you were a youngster, a lay manual went to Sing Sing prison. Yes. Did, does anything ever happen bad in West Sable? Oh, yeah, well, he was an outsider. That was an English name. It was not. <laughs> All right. But his, um, he lived around the corner from us. And it was a, what was the, the charge? It was he, he, uh, bigamy. It was bigamy, yeah, it was bigamy. Um, yeah, okay. I'm now recalling that. Uh, but he was a nice man. I liked him very much. And they always wife, look very nice. Wife, when men or wife, women, they always are so innocent. Was my, my, my piano teacher that failed. But uh, we loved old Ethel. She was a, a great lady. And, um, but he got involved with... Yeah. In any case, I'm sure there was a, a final divorce. Yeah, because that woman remarried someone else. I, yeah. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I remember that. Okay. Um, his, yeah, one of his sons uh, um, was a year ahead of me in school, George. He was right. a childhood friend. Right. Um, Still living? Still living. Right. He lives in Florida. Part of the year and up here, part of the year. Yeah. And there's another. There's another son, Dave, who was is a retired school teacher. He taught Connecticut, I think. Uh, uh, Dave, nice man. And then there's a late manual, and we've been trying to get here, but Rose's uh, husband was another son. All right. She was Rose Saunders. Ro Rose Sanders, yes. Uh -huh. All right. And then, of course, there was tragedy in West Sable. And this I remember very well. This is in the 1950s when Frank Westerbeek ended his life. Yeah. The, the house is there at Cherry Avenue and Brook Street. And he attached the exhaust from his car. And talk about a likable person. It was a, they were builders, the Westerbeek brothers. It was a huge family, so some went into other areas. But my father wired lots of houses for Eddie Westerbeek and Frank. And Frank was married to a very fine uh, gal from a, a well-established family in Sable, the Reithers. Okay. And uh, for some yes. reason, and he was very likable. And, and she too, and uh, it was a horrible tragedy. It was in the summer. July in the, in the 50s, and he attached the hose uh, to his uh, car exhaust. And Go back to that location. The, it, it was, was a large house. It's still there at the northwest corner of, of Cherry and Brook. Yeah, that was on for socks. Uh, your, the the was Western Bay house was on, on the corner of Division and Brook. In any case, People by the name of Umversak lived in the in the that yeah. northeast. Was that after that? Maybe that was after that. After that, it's possible, it's possible. But and I you remember Frank. From, you remember from, Eddie, the builder. I remember Eddie. Sure, sure. sure. He married Vanessa Dot. Ah. Yes. Uh, but they lived on that in that house on the corner of Division and Brook. Okay. Uh, it's possible now, but I remember from way back 
there were Umbersocks living in that house on the northwest corner of Cherry and Brook. Uh, I delivered Newsday, one of my things that I did in high school. I delivered Newsday. I had uh, 50, 50 customers to begin with, and I wound up with 150. And every day on the bicycle delivering. And I went all the way from there was a fishing station down on, the, uh, down on the bay, all the way up to the wireless station, and from Albert's restaurant all the way to the farm. So and every street between. I, I, so I knew where everybody lived in, in West Sayville. This must have taken quite a time. It was quite a time, And, yes. and, and, and uh, bad weather? Bad weather, and uh, snow, I had to walk it. And, uh, How old were you? Every day. How old were you? I was in, in my teens because I was, it was uh, high school, so I was uh, probably uh, 13, 14, 15. I ran in there, uh, 16. Uh, I can remember that. That was, uh, there were a lot of streets in West Salem, and that was before oh. Oh. Washington Avenue was developed. Yeah. That was woods over there. Um, there was the area where I am was, was called Rabbit City because uh, I'm, I have one of the newer houses in the area. Um, and my house was, is now 53 years old. No, about 60 years old. Um, it was one of the newest houses on the block. Um, there were only two or three houses up there at that point, and that was the, uh, the Colson house next door to me. And they had a, Lee Colson lived next door to them, and then, um, then the daughter Dorothy lived in the next house. So it was, but it was, it was rapid, they called it Rabbit City. What street is it? On Third Street at West Salem. We won't get involved with this. Uh, Miss uh, Curry from the Sable Historical Society has been very much involved with it, and I don't see our need to spend any time here, but you can certainly consult her material on the wireless in West Sable and her vain attempt to preserve uh, what was left of the structure. The towers came down, I believe, in the well, they, late 30s. They're gone. They're gone. And, uh, well... No, it was, that, be, it was uh, beyond that. I think that those towers were up there after that. The 40s, perhaps. Still, yeah. Yeah, the mm -hmm. 40s. But, uh, I, I, it was a sort of forbidden area, and I've not been up there since it's been uh, named a, a nature preserve or whatever. I've not, been, I've not been in there, no. Yeah. There's a, supposedly this... Uh, this plant that doesn't grow anywhere else in the whole world at that, that uh, this, I can't remember the name of it. I think I have one of those in my garden, but uh, that's beside the point. <laughs> but uh, uh, that's why they preserved it and they wouldn't allow it to be developed or whatever. But there was there were woods and fire uh, fire lines through the woods up in the in, in West Sayville, and then they became developed, and so we. Those were the outsiders that brought West Sable a name. We got onto the police blotters for that. And, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I you don't know when the uh, post office was established there? No, the post office was on Main Street uh, for yes. those years. In the heart of the little village. Uh, Mr. Well, here, here was certainly a non-Dutch family that was certainly important in your community, the Luces. The Luces, yes, the Luces were Come on, wonderful. Italian Catholics. They were wonderful people, and my mother was a was a, an angel to them because we lived back to back with them at apparently at one point before I came along, um, and uh, they couldn't speak English, and one of them was I think Mrs. Luce was having yet another child because uh, she had many, and uh, couldn't understand the doctor, and they came running through the woods to get my mother to oh. to help with whatever. And forever after that, yeah. uh, my mother was on some kind of a pedestal with that. And I can remember when I delivered the newspaper there, and on Friday nights I had to, do, I had to collect for the week. I was, never got out of there without a bowl of pasta fazool. Never. Eat, manja, manja. And I had to eat. And then after that, Bill, the, the, the son, Bill, owned a, uh, an ice cream store on Main Street. Yes, Bill dug out. out. Yeah. He was a uh, he was a professional baseball player for a couple of years, yeah. and um, he had all the Brooklyn Dodgers who would come out to visit and he'd be in the dugout. My uh, father was a one electric and did lots of uh, electrical yeah. wiring, 
for the Lewis's. They were yeah. excellent customers. Yeah. There, and there was one that became the gardener at uh, Sparrow yes. Park. Yeah, he was a wonderful guy too. But, uh, and uh, then there also was the Kondreva family. The Kondreva family, yep. They were another Italian family that uh, they lived on, on Rollstone Avenue. Right. One of their sons became a priest. Yes. He had his first mass at uh, St. Lawrence's. Oh, my, my, my wife had a funny story about that. They, uh, there were so many jellyfish in the bay that they took the children to someplace else now. I can't remember where it was, maybe to Lake Ronkonkoma, maybe, for their Red Cross swimming lesson. And there were so many kids that they piled them in the back seat. And she said, I got to sit on, I can't remember the the Kondreva's name, but George, George, I guess maybe, but she sat on his lap all the way to Ron Conkerman, and she said, years later, she said, and that's the one that became a priest. I'm sure that he had to go into confession for that. <laughs> what, was, what was your Halloween story you were going to say? Oh, there was the, these people, two doors down, three doors down, well, we had outhouses at that point. I was brought up with an outhouse out behind the garage. And um, I had problems with internal problems because of that, because my sister, who was older than I, told me that there were spiders in there, so I never wanted to go near it, and so as a result, I had problems. But anyhow, uh, two doors down, Henry Vanderborg lived there. Now, Henry Vanderborg was George Vanderborg's father. George Vanderborg of the oyster. Who became Dr. George, Dr. George Vanderborg. Yes. Whose daughter graduated with me, but anyhow. Yes, um, and she still attends your reunions. Yes, yes. Very. Nice. But this, they always knocked over his outhouse on Halloween. Always, it was just, and he would put people out there watching, and they would still figure out how to knock it over. They, my father, told stories about putting something on a, on a attaching it to a window of a house and then they had a string that had knots in it and they would run their hand over the and it went on the, on the string uh, you know just to just as a prank as a prank they, they were no, no no bad things that they did but it was just uh, that was their entertainment there was just nothing else to do and they were allowed to do that on Halloween. Mr. Harold who attended an earlier session yes. uh, reminisced at least to me about uh, the double seater outhouses yes. and how they used to enjoy knocking them over yes. in Sayville. Yeah, we, 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 ours was a double seater. Ours was a double seater. I remember I had, my father had to dig a big hole to dispose of the contents uh, regularly. We had a very good garden in the backyard there. And <laughs> when did your family get a car? They had. I believe that they had a car by the time I was born. Uh, it was always an old car, an old clunker, um, that my father worked on himself to, uh, on the motor. Uh, I, I, there was always a car in the family, but I don't remember exactly when that they, they acquired the car. I do know that my father, before I was born, uh, they had a, uh, a, a garage. Well, it wasn't a garage then. It was a workshop or something. Uh, and he expanded it, doubled size, so, so that he could put the car in there. Uh, it was a dirt floor out in there, and it had a, um, a loft so that we could store things up in there. And he had a workshop on the other side of it where he had his carpentry tools and things like that over there. But uh, So that was there when I was after I was, before I was born. I was born in that house. Uh, there are several other houses in town where uh, the rest of the children were born. Uh, but my, I believe my sister was born in that house too, the youngest sister. But the rest of them were born here and there because they lived in several houses in West Sable before that. When did you have inside plumbing? We didn't have inside plumbing until, uh, let's see. It had to be, it had to be in 19, late 1940s. 
in the Rako house at 316 Lincoln Avenue was the hand pump in the kitchen. Oh, yeah, that was, yeah. So now so I, do, I don't recall that. You got that. only the cold water, yeah. but you had to go to the cold stove. Right, and you had to heat it up, and then you, you this copper tub. Would and, of course, they had a, sit a, an outhouse in the back. But my grandfather's house had a pump in the kitchen. I remember that. But they were they had an, they had indoor plumbing before I did, before we did. But they had um, they had an outhouse too. And I can always remember that one aunt calling it the potty garage, potty garage. But it was never knocked over. Yeah, I don't recall that one ever not, nor ours. Not ours were not was not knocked over. Uh, but always, poor old Mr. Vanderbrooks always got it. Um, did you, when did your mother get a washing machine? They had, well, I don't recall when my mother got one, but I know my grandmother had one. It was out on the back porch, and they had to heat the water to do But my grandfather, I can remember him sitting in the chair next to the, and it had a handle on the outside for the agitator. Boom. I can remember him um, doing the, you know, helping with the laundry. Uh, my mother, I don't, I think she did it by hand. A lot of that was by hand with a scrub board. I know, I know what she did in Mr. Ross's shirts and then she had to starch them and, and, and iron them. I can remember her doing that. I can remember having to take those shirts down to Mr. Ross. And then that would be, uh, she wouldn't get paid for that, but they would take the money off the bill that, was, that we paid for, that we know the money. I have a word or two on the, the growth of utilities in Sable. That is electric lines and telephone lines. And again, conservative res residents stated, we've done without this previously. Why do we have to pay for this now, etc.? And there was really a lot of vocal resistance. Yeah. We did not have a telephone. Uh, when there was a phone call, it was they would come out the backyard in the backyard and, and holler um, from my grandfather's because they had a phone, and um, uh, they would they would come telephone call and we'd have to run over and answer. But that was rare, and it was a party line yet too, and there were several people on the party line, and you had you had your own ring. Uh, and you had an operator, of course, that you had to go through to get a, a phone call. So, all of these things that younger people do. On another, uh, <laughs> you're shaking your head. But uh, yeah, this is true. This economic is true. issue, as I said, the uh, old school was at uh, Lincoln Avenue and North Main Street. Oh, yeah, I don't recall that. And. Uh, there were proceedings, obviously. The population was growing, etc. We need to have a new school. So uh, there was considerable debate in Sable. And there were some early votes in Sable. I'm getting in this all from early Suffolk County newses. And all the votes were negative. In other words, you know, we used it. Why should we? We're not going to be here. So by, fortunately, 1888, that was before by that time, <laughs> and Mr. Hogue and others uh, wrote in the paper that uh, they're glad that uh, at last there has been a positive vote, largely because older conservative residents have passed away, and their negative votes are no longer here, so we managed to get the new school built. The school cost around 15000 This is old 88. Now, this is not the complete building because later they put a huge addition on. Just by contrast, I want to know that St. Anne's Church cost around 20000 But look what fine work and all that stained glass and all. <clears throat> then, uh, later, to build, yes, the, I can't speak about the uh, financial scene for the high school. That was 1928, so things were going well. But there was trouble again in building the elementary school here. 
which finally got approved for 1938. I mean, we're in the middle of the Depression, and properties had to be cleared here. Thomas Otto had a sister living in a house right by here, and she wasn't going to move out for anything. And Thomas put huge letters in the Suffolk County News imploring his sister in view of the community, look what you're doing. <laughs> so finally, the, the property must have been confiscated, etc. The school was built, but by an appro approval, the fig I have the figure somewhere, by around 16 votes or so, Amazing. the elementary school was approved. The library has that kind of history. Nineteen early nineteen forties, uh, they didn't they voted down a memorial library to be built on the Gillette property. So, did you have any memories of the house that was the library when you no, were young? No, not at all, not at all, okay. not at all. Uh, I didn't start. Uh, I didn't start uh, my trek through the. Um, all the shelves out here, which I'm losing. I'm losing that battle. Uh, but I started when I was in Collins Avenue uh, in the one where this came from. Uh, for many, many years, I didn't have time to read. And um, I, really, I felt badly about that. But now I'm having an absolute ball. I'm here two or three times a week um, because my wife is, she's on my card too. So I, she's, I bring her books to read. But um, Right now, I'm in the middle of James Bishoner, and he's. Uh, and I never, I hated history when I was in school, but even now. Even with Miss Harron. Yeah, even with Miss Harron, the, the dear lady. But I, I didn't like it. But I'm now. I'm enjoying it because I guess maybe because I'm older. I'm, I'm. Oh, that's why they're doing this, and that's why they did that, and it, I'm putting things together more now than you know. And I was not. I was not stupid. I. I Wound up number seven in my class, but uh, I just didn't like that kind of a thing. And um, but now I'm having a ball reading. I'm having having a good time with it. Did you commute from Sable to the city for your job? Thirty-eight years. Thirty-eight years on the train. Two hours in each direction. I don't know how we, how you ever could do that for how many years? Thirty-eight years. Oh my, I mean, coming out this morning was a nightmare with the disabled trains and yeah, all. And I, I was supposed to attend a uh, major event with the Long Island. Oh, we never did Manhattan. get there. I, it, it was being held in, no. in Bayshore, and I never got out there that uh, evening. This was back in May. I yeah, think. yeah, yeah. Uh, I have looked at a 1927 yearbook of Sable High School. And there at the, for, with the faculty, you can find the faces immediately. Oh, yeah, they're there. Because these people, I mean, I had them in the 1950s, and with all due respect, they were marvelous uh, people. They, they did not change. I mean, Mr. Brucci is clearly recognizable. He served in World War I, incidentally. He graduated, this is Joseph Brucci, graduated from Columbia College, in 1923, his uh, attendance having been interrupted by his service in World War I. And the literature about him, I looked it up in, in the Columbia material. He was a very promising poet. And everyone expected a great literary career from him. He ends up being a, a sable school teacher, for a while a principal, and he clearly showed when I had him as a teacher in the, in 52, 53, that he was an embittered person, that he never got out of life what he really, and he was a sable boy who went on to Columbia College of Columbia University, and certainly had a good record there, but a, a bitter person within, you'll agree. Yeah. Then there was also Miss Heron, you can recognize Miss Heron immediately in 1927, and she continued teaching here till the 1960s. And then the one and only teacher of mathematics, Harriet Berge. Yes. Who oh, look? Who oh, did really? Again, from the yearbook photos, didn't change that much. 1927 to 1950s, and she was very stern, very strict. I mean, imagine she had a. What, what teacher would go to this limit today? 
she had a, an after-school math session. Not that I was weak and all, but just good practice. And one day I went home, you know, I had enough today. She called up that evening and spoke with my father yet. You know, Emil didn't come to that after-school math session today. I mean, and then there was a, uh, oh, there's an old friend. He's class of 49, Herman Berg. Sonny Berg lives on, right over here on Willard Avenue. And uh, he had trouble in sixth grade with learning in general, I would say. And his school teacher, Lucille White, no? Who was from West Virginia, who grew up with brothers, and she had flaming red hair and broad shoulders. And let me tell you, you didn't, if you didn't know it, beware, you didn't fool around in her class. Well, he was having trouble learning. Can you imagine this after school? She walked from the elementary school here and it was a very cold day, Sonny recalls his nickname, up to Willard Avenue and spoke with Mrs. Berg about your son's problems. She then walked, think of this, all the way back to where she lived on Gillette Avenue in that well-known establishment, the Alvin, run by Mrs. Sawyer. So that's where Miss White lived. I mean, that was quite a chore. What teacher today? I mean, walk? But uh, she eventually married a Hungarian fellow by the name of Zabo, S-Z-A-B-O. He oh. predeceased her. Oh, okay. He predeceased her, I gather. She went eventually back to West Virginia, and there was never any obituary in the Sable paper, but I heard that she reached 91. Ugh. A hale and hearty I individual. I Zabo. But... You certainly no. I well, she not, no. You she didn't, didn't have teach her. me. She taught your one of my kids. Yes. Yeah. yeah yes. I remember when I was I was recuperating from an appendicitis, and I was oh two weeks pro, pro stop I guess, and the children were she was taking a group of children to the Hayden Planetarium and the Museum of Natural, uh, Natural History, History very nice. on a school bus, and mm -hmm. me with just post op and bouncing up and down the school oh. bus all the way to New York City. <laughs> and one of those kids recognized me after all these years. Um, she was at one of my daughter's reunions and she said, Mr. Powie, oh, and you still have your mustache. And, <laughs> and amazing, that child remembered me from being on that trip. I was not a disciplinarian by any means. But because uh, we were all made obeying, a great impression. we were always uh, obeying Mrs. Stabo then. But uh, yeah, she was, a, she was a good teacher. Good teacher. Okay. Thank you very much, William Powie, for this very illuminating, exciting interview. We certainly have enjoyed this uh, session. I enjoyed it too. And thank, thank you, you. Miss Lepore. Thank you.